How I came to ballet was my mother who introduced me when I was four years old. She took us to the Metropolitan Opera House in New York City to see the Royal Ballet. And it was Swan Lake. And the dancers were the great, my hero, Rudolf Nureyev, dancing with Dame Meryl Park. And the astounding thing to me was, I, I know now who Dame Meryl Park is and, and I was as a dancer, but I didn't see her, I saw him. I was mesmerized sitting in that chair going, that man is flying. He crossed the Metropolitan Opera stage in three grand jetés and I was hooked. And it's like I've heard in America, the dancing bug. He poisoned me with this bug. But unfortunately, I was born with my feet and my ankles very en dedans. Is that correct? Yes, en dedans. And my parents felt I was too weak. I had been sick as a child with a blood disease. And I almost died twice. And so they were not wanting me to investigate this, but I didn't see anything else from four. So I ran around the house <laughs> making costumes out of whatever clothing I could and putting myself in my tennis shoes on my toes going, look, mommy, look. And my opa lived with us. He came from Puerto Rico, from musicians. My great-grandfather was a Buena Vista social club type guitarist in Puerto Rico. So I knew music. But he, for some reason, a man with only the eighth grade education, he knew who Ana Pavlova was and said to my mother in Spanish, but Tonya, she has Ana Pavlova's feet. I never got to ask him how he knew, but he did. And so after seven years of running around the apartment and the building and the neighborhood making everybody crazy, look, I'm a ballerina, my grandfather finally got permission and my mother found a school in Carnegie Hall called Newbert Ballet. Christine Newbert was a disciple of Tudor. And many of her teachers in the school were from the Diaghilev Company. For example, Nina Popova, who established the Houston Ballet. She was one of my ballet teachers. She had a host of teachers from everywhere. Netherlands, England, Russia. So we were very mixed. But I was almost 12 when I began dancing. And so it was very stressful because I was entering a world I didn't know. And I was so excited to be there. As I thought of this last night, I remember being in love with all of my ballet teachers and mesmerized by them that I see everything from my past, but I don't remember their words. And most of my learning was by osmosis of just watching everything. And the reason Miss Newbert took me was when she did my audition and had me jump, I never heard her scream the way she screamed. And she just looked at me because she's like, where did that come from? Can you do it again? And I said, yes, and did. And there she ran to my mother, Mrs. Cardona, your daughter can be a star. She lost her mind and my mother went, Lady, I don't care. I just want her to stop bothering me with this ballet. Take her. So I went. By the time I turned 15, I went to the North Carolina School of the Arts, which is a very Balanchine-based school. And I started to learn this syllabus, this way of moving. And the one person who really turned me on, honestly, although it was disappointing at the time, was Mimi Paul Avedon. When I asked her why she wasn't saying more to me, she said, you need to fix your placement. And that was the first seed for me. No one had explained this to me that I could recall. And there began my search of why am I different than the other dancers? They had more time. They weren't so excited that they couldn't hear anything because they were finally given their dream after begging for seven years. I didn't do so well there on a psychological and emotional level because I went into university but I was 16 years old. I graduated from the Fame High School in New York City for music and I had excelled in music but I had to make a decision, are you gonna do music or are you gonna dance? But dancing was there. I did not know how to behave at that point as a 16 year old in university with everybody so much older with a lot more experience. So I didn't do very well and I was kicked out, but that was a gift yet again. I went back to New York and then my mother of dance, Valerie Taylor, 
Valerie Taylor was a soloist with the Sadler's Wells Royal Ballet and a protege of Margot Fontaine. She was my ballet mama. And in a conversation, I said, I'm so sad that I couldn't have gone to the Royal Ballet. And she just looked at me and said, well, why didn't you say so? Four months later, I was on a plane to London, having been accepted with honors because of the letter she wrote. I was given one year study at the Royal Ballet School at the upper school. And it was the most complete education I felt at that point I could be given. Everything was in this program, drama, music, and not just studying how to write theory, but standing up with a pianist who understood the ballet technique, understood ballet combinations and how to play with the music and the rhythms. And he's the one who turned me on to understanding one combination can be done in many different ways, depending on what the music is and how it's set. So that then set me up another thing in my head, okay, music is huge, and I know music, so this won't be so hard. So I had my wonderful year, I came back to America, nobody would take me in the company, because I was so very British style and not Balanchine, which everybody wanted in America, unless you went to Ballet West in Utah, or Houston, which had turned very royal ballet because of Ben Stevenson, who was Valerie's partner. <laughs> years before. But because I was of a middle class family who immigrated from Puerto Rico, I was a first generation in the mainland, as we call it, and there wasn't that kind of money available to my family to send me to audition. So after about eight months of trying, I had nothing. So I went to work in a health club <laughs> to make money and continue dancing and paying for private lessons with Valerie and also really Berman, because I met him when I was 15 and I was too scared of him and his work <laughs> to enter fully into what he had to offer. I wound up quitting for two years. I worked a regular job in a regular health club. I made a lot of money and said, okay, well, you've got brains, you can make money, but this dancing thing wasn't finished. And something very deep and personal happened that just made me switch back and I went, that's it. I'm going back to dancing. And there I went to Willie. And we began a very long relationship together where he gave me those missing things. And it's what ties in everything I do today as a teacher. I was teaching since I'm 15, I've been given the opportunity to work with little ones and understand how to hone this craft. So I always had a second backup in case I were to ever get injured and not have the chance to make my living as a dancer. My parents always said this to me, it will end one day. Your body can only do so much. So I kept that. So after four months, I had my first job and I just kept going and I was very much a gypsy as a ballerina because I didn't fit in anywhere for various reasons. One of them, honestly, in America is the fact that I am not, and I'm gonna say it, I'm not white enough, but I'm not black enough because I'm in the middle. When you're from the Caribbean, you have everything in you. I have Europe in me because of the Spanish. I have the native Taino Indian in me from Puerto Rico and I also have African in me from the slaves who were brought to the Caribbean when the Indians committed mass suicide because they refused to be slaves. And I feel that spirit to this day. <laughs> so ABT didn't want me, I didn't fit in. All the big companies, she doesn't fit in, she doesn't fit in, she doesn't fit in. Cynthia Gregory is the person who gave me a very big break. We used to take class together with Willie. And when she put together a little tour to Taiwan, I met then someone from Dance Theater of Harlem. He was my partner for Tarantella. And he kept saying, Mr. Mitchell would love you. You should come, you should come. And I thought, oh, I'm in the Met Opera. It's a nice gig. It's good money. <laughs> I'm in New York. And I thought, well, maybe I'll try. I called. They said, come. I took class. And Mr. Mitchell made me laugh from day one, even though I was terrified of him. I was so intrigued with this man, and he looked at me, and, and I could tell he liked my feet. 
<laughs> and thought, okay, maybe this will get you the job. Let's point them. And within, I don't know, half an hour, he called me into the office and said, ah, I'm going to give you a contract. And, and okay. And so the company was going into performance. I came in right as they got ready to go into the Brooklyn Academy of Music. And after their two-week run, they had taught me Firebird Maidens and said, do you want to go in? And I looked around and went, okay, yes. And they asked, would you like a rehearsal? And I saw how tired all the other dancers were and went, nah, I'm fine, let's just do this. <laughs> and everybody's going, ooh, 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 I'm like, what? I'm trying to keep you happy. So you're my friends in the future. You have to do nice things for people. I was terrified on that stage, but I just stared at my opposite girl and did everything I had to do. And Mr. Mitchell, as Balanchine and many directors, they come backstage at the end and give their notes. And he looked at me and went, very good. He said, OK, step one, you're good. I lasted for about four years in DTH, but it is where I had my life-changing injury. The Theater of Harlem has one of the best lecture demonstrations I've ever witnessed. It is so thorough and complete, and the company goes everywhere. We do them in, we've done them in South Africa, Asia, all over the world. In one section, there are three women and three men who have to do a line of a diagonal for the men, and the ladies are in a straight line. The first woman jumps, grand jeté, she's caught around the waist, and contracts. The next one, a little bit further, to show the range of jumping power that we have. And I was always the second girl, which is a little stutter, because it's not quite big enough for the jump that I had, and it's not a little bit enough space that I can just take one step and go. And my partner was not ready for me. At 9 o'clock in the morning, I did grand jeté to a two-meter tall man, and as he put his arm out to catch me, my front leg hit him here. And he tried to go over, but he didn't. And so my leg went into my pelvis, and I flew backwards, and I landed on L5. I think it was T7 or 6, and also on my neck. So I hit in three places and slid across the New York State Theater stage. And I laid on the floor going, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's not going to be pretty when you stand up. I couldn't feel anything because I was so shocked. The MC said, OK, dancers, let's do that again. So I had to go back. I went back and I tried again. And I felt the fear, like any dancer, when you have an accident. And he sent us back again. And at that point, all I could do was send knives out of my eyes to him to say, get me off stage. I can't be here anymore. Something's wrong, and I feel like I'm bleeding. So we did it. I phoned it in, as we say. My partner was shaking. He was so upset. I felt so badly for him. It was an accident. Got off the stage, and I kept dancing. I had a premiere. I didn't want to miss it. I didn't realize the extent of my injury. No one told Mr. Mitchell what happened to me. So I continued to dance. I went, it took me three days to get a doctor's appointment. And finally, when I got to the doctor, he listened to the wrong thing that I said, which was, I'm worried for my job. And so he signed off and allowed me to continue dancing and just gave me anti-inflammatories to deal with the situation. After three years of this, I was crooked. It looked like I had scoliosis. I had lost almost all the power in my right leg and could barely walk, never mind dance. And I finally went, it's time to stop. This isn't working. I don't want to be 40 and be in a wheelchair. So I called the studio and asked if Mr. Mitchell would come in. Some days he wouldn't come in. He came in. He met me, and I told him, and he was very surprised. It's like, they didn't tell you. That's when I found out. They never told him what happened to me. So he never understood, and that's why I saw later he was angry with me that my body couldn't do certain things, but he didn't know why. There was a reason for it. So I begged him, please, let me have six months, and I promise you I will rebuild my body. 
and I will come back better. And it's what I did. I spent six months, I had to talk about that thing, but six months, three days a week in physical therapy and three days a week in gyrotonic. And I learned so much in that time. I felt like the old TV show, The Six Million Dollar Woman, we're gonna rebuild her, get her strong again. Because I was so determined, it's like, okay, I was 33 years old looking at the end of my career and you know, the young dancers are there and you're sweating because they're coming and they can do things and your body's broken and your soul is a bit broken. Everything was a bit broken. But gyrotonic changed it. It changed my perspective, all of this movement of spiraling and natural breath to make movement happen freed me from everything that was locked. The physical therapy gave me the strength to support that which I had lost. And so when I returned, everybody went, you're taller, you're, what, what? but they couldn't believe it. I rebuilt everything. And at that point began my, Research of going, okay, how do you make all of these things that you're learning in gyrotonic work for you in the ballet class when you're just working for your pure clean technique? And how can you then transfer it into a classical ballet? It's much easier to translate gyrotonic into modern dance. When I first entered, most of the teachers and dancers were from Martha Graham, not the ballet dancers. There were some around, but I've watched and I just, I've always had the gift that my eyes understand things. I'm an extremely observant person. Sometimes it'll take me a moment to process. I have to go away for a few days and then I can come back and I'll have it for you. And people don't understand that about me. Sometimes I'm slower because I really want to dot the I and cross the T like we've spoken of and be sure of what I'm doing. Gyrotonic taught me to breathe and relax in movement and allow my body to tell me where it needed support instead of me imposing what I thought it should be. And then I had the best time with my body, the best time with my dancing that I found the last three years of my career. I had many outer body moments on stage where the minute I hit the stage and I hit the light, I was not feeling anything of me. I know I was there and stuff was going on, but I just wasn't there. It was being one with everything. And I achieved that because I was able to bring myself to a calm place to go, you know what, Leslie? Ballet is wonderful. Dancing is wonderful. But it's about you now and what you're bringing and what you put in. And this is what you've been waiting for your whole life is to get on that stage and just throw it all away and just be. There's, there was no counting. There was no, I could see my partner. I knew where he was, but I just, I tell you, I would just sit there going, I don't feel anything. I'm not in my body. It's so amazing. And I loved it and went, darn, I'm sorry I'm getting older because I could really go deeper in this vague, in this way. So as I continued teaching gyrotonic, I decided this would be the best career transition for me. And it was. It also introduced me to my husband. A friend of mine knew my husband from Vienna because my husband is really originally from Graz in the Styria region of Austria. He came here with his family when he was 15 and he knew one of the dancers from the Staatsopera. They were good friends. And he then met my friend who came to Vienna to perform in Katz at the, was it the Ronacher or on the Tetch on the Wien was where Katz was. And so they met and they had this unbelievable friendship for years. My friend would always talk about Christian, my husband and other people that he wanted me to know about over here since his life was here. And I thought one day maybe I'll visit. And so Greg called me one day close to my retirement point. He knew I was getting ready to leave and do something new and said, Christian's finishing chiropractic and you're doing gyrotonic. You're both there to help people. You have something really cool in common. You should talk together. And that's what we did for three weeks. After three weeks, we met. And after a crazy whirlwind weekend, we both realized we had met our, our equal and our match and our counter partner. 
and our relationship went from there. He asked me if I would marry him and come to Austria because part of his scholarship in this university for chiropractic stipulated he must return to Austria to try and get chiropractic to be recognized. That's why I came with him. I didn't care where we were going, what city, I just wanted to be with him. My first years here, I worked in hobby schools and saw the difference in a different way between European and American ways of working with students and teaching. And eventually, as you well know, Simona Noja, I came to you because after working privately with some of the students from the school, I kept seeing the same issue in what was being translated to these young people with these big dreams and seeing that many of them were being broken on not just physical but emotional and psychological levels, which for me, it's a kind of an issue of what are we really doing with these young people with these big dreams, hopes, and aspirations, and innocence, and naivete, that we translate this to them in a way that is loving, and caring, and tolerant, yet strict, and giving clear, concise information to help them, like I did, peel away the tensions, peel away the stresses, and find you in it that you can put yourself in it without destroying your vehicle. Many people are very stuck in their ways, as we know, and I agree with tradition. I am a huge traditionalist. I will give a little example why. In one pickup group that I was performing with, we were doing the Floristan Pas de Trois from Ashton's Sleeping Beauty. And I had done this many years before with Valerie Taylor and Petrus Bosman. And I learned this role down. And the musicality of Ashton <laughs> is something. If you don't execute the port de bras correctly, the step does not work. And that coda is fast. And one of the dancers who was also sharing the role with me kept on, she was just a bit taller than me and very beautiful more experienced than I, but she couldn't get it. And I dragged her in the corner, I'm like, just do the border. <laughs> but she just was like, no, no, no. I was like, all right, it's on you. But I got very upset then in the studio. Somebody said something, and I said, you know what? I'm sorry, I'm gonna say it. Ashton is rolling in his grave right now. When was this choreographed? When did he choreograph Sleeping Beauty? And what year is this? It's 1990, what? If you can't do that, what they did in the 40s or the 50s, why are you dancing? This is my attitude, sorry. <laughs> but if you're a dancer, you have to take these things into consideration. And so my objective, if I had been this taller dancer, would have been, okay, I gotta make this work. What do you do when it's fast and you're long and you're tall? You bring it in, you make it a little smaller until you get it under control and your body starts to find the way and then you expand. But to shut yourself down and say, no, I don't work this way. And I see that a lot. And I understand that that's coming from those old days of those old ways that you do, you don't talk, you don't ask, you just do what's told to you. So because my mother was an educator, I looked at my teachers, how they were saying things to me and why and when. What was the tone? What was the look in their, in their eyes when they spoke to me? These things were very important to me to receive the information I needed. So now as a teacher, I see this all going on and I was thinking to myself, okay, what is the best thing I could do to help people? Whether or not they, they want to realize a professional career isn't important to me. It's more about them finding out who they are, what makes them tick and what makes them happy and that they have an experience in the studio that is one where they're learning something about classical ballet with some of the gyrotonic philosophies because they do apply very much so in classical ballet and how to keep it authentic and just have a good time. Walk away going, I've accomplished 
one or two things, I really accomplish them. I don't need to do everything all at once. That's too much. You can't eat the whole cake in one bite, right? <laughs> and so as a teacher, I try to give this to the dancers as well. It's just calm down and remember that everything is a process. I went through probably a very bizarre process as a ballerina <laughs> that a lot of people haven't gone through. And maybe that's what makes what I do a little bit different than other teachers. But I do believe that if more organizations, large ones in particular, would take the time to invest in their teachers to get them to calm down, because a lot of them aren't so calm. A lot of them have this pressure as well. I've got to get this syllabus out. I've got to get, I got to, I got to, I got to. What are their priorities for these people? And how do you help them to help the students best? It's always going to start from the top and trickle down. And so in my class, as you heard, I don't always play classical music because I see them getting a little, <laughs> so I'll put something more modern to see, can you do this classical element in this type of music and change the nuance of it, change the essence of it, change the flavor. One minute you can think, okay, I'm putting chocolate into my feed, and then the can be some cheese, mm, some syrup, caramel. Give me a flavor. Give me something, something that, that makes me go, oh, wow, I like that. It doesn't have to be big. It has to be you, from you, from your heart that you go, okay, I'm having so much fun, I'm gonna do this. And if I make a mistake, okay, I'm gonna keep going on. It's not the end of the world. It's okay to be wrong. That's how you learn. And if you have people who are calm, helping you, when you get in those moments when you know you see a dancer, they get crazy in the corner, they're upset with themselves because they didn't do something, I did it. We all did it. But I don't forget those things. And when I lay down at night, before I go to sleep, I say my thanks, and I'm very grateful, and I list whatever I can remember if I'm not very tired. <laughs> and I find myself thinking, okay, this girl did this and this, and it starts. And then I have to tell my mind, stop it, go to sleep, you'll fix it in the morning. But it's always a thing of how can I help them stop beating themselves here and here? We are our vehicles, we are our product. And so it's very difficult for dancers to differentiate that, that border of, okay, I'm still a human being, I'm still valid, I'm a dancer too, I'm more than dance. Remember once I said to Willie Berman, you know, it's not rocket science. And he said, no, you're right, it's not. But take care how you say this because saying it this way makes it seem like it's nothing and it is something. And I looked and I said, as always, thank you for the lesson, Master, because he was right. Everything has its place. And that, I think, is why with this stage, it's so important. There is no place currently in Austria. It's very difficult dance here. I'm going to say it. It's really hard here. When I first came, I kept looking around going, but where's the open class? Where's the, the dance library? Where's the videos? Because you're so spoiled in New York with the Lincoln Center Library. I lived in there. Every ballet that I had to perform, if there was a videotape of the original Balanchine, I went and found it and sat there writing notes and looking at how they did everything. Resources. The resources here do not exist for people that are in this type of a situation where you're out of school, you don't know what to do with yourself. This is the most difficult time going, what am I gonna do, I don't have a job. Then, unfortunately, because of this COVID situation, my heart melts for these ladies. But I looked at them yesterday when some of them were seeming frustrated and said, look, take this moment as an opportunity to clean all these little things that you know aren't working for you. Build yourself up to be prepared for an audition, that you take an audition like it's another class, it's another day of you doing you. Not for them, for you. So that as the world opens up and returns to what it was, you will be prepared to take a step forward and find your job and your place in the world of dance. And it doesn't matter if it's classical or musical theater or, or, or. If you want to dance and that's not working, go another way. But don't stop. 
I've done this with many students that were let go from larger institutions that I've helped them to find their way in America or somewhere else in Europe because people have talent, a lot of them. And the ballet world, yes, it is very cruel and you have to be all very diva and beautiful and blah, blah, blah. But if you can't be that, then do something else that makes you happy. Go flamenco, but don't stop moving. Don't ever stop moving. So then again, being back in the situation of Austria and the dance scene, you have no open classes. So you're not able to go and watch the senior dancers as examples such as I had. The majority of New York City ballet was in Willie Berman's class. Baby T was in Willie Berman's class. Martha Graham was in Willie's class. Lara Lubavitch and so on and so on. Dancers from all over the world, the Royal Ballet. You know that Julio Bocans and Alessandra Ferry were constantly there. There were so many of us that were there and you had this energy in the room that you go, oh my God, look how beautiful that is. I gotta go there. I want to be that. I'm going to take that from Alessandra. I'm taking that from Isabel Garin. I'm going to take that from Mary Barhiri and Judy Fugue, blah, 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 and all of them. Each one of them had something for me. All of them. Lourdes Lopez, these tall, tall women that move so fast. I never saw anything like that. I was like, wow. And I figured out then it's possible. It's possible for people to switch between these styles of royal to Balanchine. Royal to Balanchine has one good connection, which is as we were speaking, it's the Cicchetti in there that you see the Brits can do Balanchine as well. Other styles still have a difficult time to perform Balanchine because of how their technique is prepared on the body. And that's why I changed the music in my class because for me, dancing Balanchine was all about that syncopation jazzy rhythm in the classical music because that's what pushes you forward and that's what made it so unique and special. People are like, what is that? Why is it different? It was the jazz. And there's a woman named Teresa Howard who's the, I believe, the creator of a thing called Mob Ballet. And Teresa Howard is a former colleague of mine from Dance Theater of Harlem. She has on YouTube a long symposium about dance, African Americans, and Balanchine, and how much these choreographers looked to the black dancers for the rhythms. Those rhythms he took, that's why Arthur Mitchell was vital and crucial to him. There are people who said things about Mr. Mitchell I will not repeat, which were not nice as far as his technique, but that man was a god on stage, and he knew his partnering, and he knew his music. And there was obviously a reason why Balanchine chose him too. And it wasn't just that he was black. And people need to know that because there's more to the story. It's much deeper. And having been in Dance Theater of Harlem as my mainstay company, I was a soloist with them. I lasted 11 years. In between, I stopped and did musical theater and performed in a Broadway tour. Learned, I don't like Broadway. Not for me. Lovely, but thank you, no. So. Taking all of this mishmash of my career and going, wow, you can apply this stuff to everybody, Leslie. So what do you do next? How do you help these young people? And I see it, it's as you've observed, sometimes I'll stop and say, get on the floor. Just feel yourself for a second and listen and move just one little thing and see what resonates through you. Take a moment and be aware, be mindful but you have to have peace to have that experience. So that's where I'm working now is to help these young people. Because I remember me, I was completely, they called me a hurricane kamikaze Leslie because I was fearless. I went for everything. I didn't care. I was an animal, a beast. But I looked later on as I matured and went, you know, you should have slowed down there a little bit, Missy. That was a bit too fast. You missed something. And then I started to go, okay, fill in those blanks. And that's what courses and groups like this are about, is filling in those blanks for them, with them. Because once they've completed and it's all set here, then they can calm down and really go forward as an artist, not just a dancer. I'm not into creating a one-trick pony that can do lots of things. I don't care if your body's perfect. I want to see how you work. And are you working honestly, with integrity, 
That's more important to me. So I'd rather do a few simple things because that's where you find most of your information is when you do less, less is more. We know this. And so when I see that happening with them, I watch these young ladies and the first day I knew, we're all nervous, me included. It's normal. You're meeting people you haven't met before. You don't know what the teacher's going to ask from you. You don't know if they're going to be this, ah, or if they're going to be, ah. you don't know. Some of the dancers have had experience with me, not that many. But by the second day, I saw all the tension go there. Like they felt safe with me. And that's important to me as a teacher. They feel safe because then they can work and they're not working with that excess tension that's not necessary in the head of, oh my God, this lady's scaring me. You can't work with fear. So seeing that, they gave me more permission to go further. And I let the class dictate to me what they need. So they teach me, in essence, what it is I need to do for them. I usually demonstrate the first few days so they can see certain things, but I'm getting older now. <laughs> so I like to demonstrate a little less. But finally, like today, I didn't say and do anything. I just kept pushing the button and made them just go. And because we stayed with the consistent vein of combinations and things, I could see them calm down and start to put themselves into it. And in a week, the changes that they made, they were so generous, so generous with their going, all right, I'm going to follow you. This nonverbal communication of, yes, I'm going to follow you. I like what you're doing. It makes sense. And I can't help it, even if it's COVID, I got to touch them. I can't not touch them. I know what it means. Touch is so important in dance. And a lot of people don't get that. So for me, it was a great time because I got to also use my hands the way I like to, to help them feel the support to feel that they can stand there calmly and let things work from a natural progression to building. They brought, I would say, almost all the corrections that I wanted because they really brought the corrections for me. And it was a lovely time. I laughed a lot. <laughs> and I know they laughed also. I have no idea how they feel. And if they feel they've accomplished anything, I hope so. I do hope so, because for me, it was a lot of fun. And it got me in shape. <laughs>